May I speak to the glory of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, we hear the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. It feels like it's only a couple of weeks since I quoted this exact passage, but again it seems so relevant. Must be something about this season moving from the Epiphany towards Lent. In the first reading from Exodus, we hear Moses going up the mountain, up Mount Sinai, to receive the law and the Ten Commandments for the first time. After they're rejected, he has to go up a second time and collect them again. But we hear the glory of the Lord is visible as a devouring fire on top of the mountain. Visible, no doubt, from miles around, illuminating the area. Visible, blinding almost. And then in today's Gospel, we hear another account of a high mountain. This time it is Jesus ascending it, together with Peter and James and John. They meet with Moses and Elijah, and there Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes were dazzling white. Jesus' face shining like the sun, shining so brightly, illuminating all that is around him. Recently at our vision day, Father Richard asked the question about who Jesus is to each of us. A question that you could say is fairly important, since it leads to the question of why we are here. Why do you come each week? What difference does following Jesus make to your life? Why do I mention this today? Well, an understanding of Jesus shown in today's Gospel could be fairly important. Jesus, God made man, glowing like the sun. Jesus, God made man, shining out God's glory. Jesus, God made man, illuminating all around him. When a bright light is illuminated, things which had been hidden are exposed. Just yesterday in the news, there was something about the Arch community, about their founder, Jean Vanier, having sexually assaulted at least six women. This is news on top of everything about Bishop Peter Ball, in the Chichester and Gloucester dioceses. The former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick in the Roman Catholic Church in the USA. And then John Smythe and the Ewan camps in the UK and so on. Abuse in the church doesn't seem to get any better. It gets worse as one thing after another comes out. Charismatic, convincing, coercive leaders of Christian organisations, some ordained, some lay, preying on and committing terrible crimes on vulnerable people. People who then took years before feel, feeling able to admit what had happened. And then when they did, they were often disbelieved because no one could believe an apparently saintly person could possibly do such a thing. And then a bishop or archbishop deciding to cover up the news, cover up the disclosure, trying to prevent police investigations, preferring to move the offending cleric to another parish far away, in the hope that no one would find out and in the hope that they wouldn't do it again. 
all operating in darkness, hoping that nothing would come to light, hoping that it wouldn't be discovered. This is not what the church is called to be. We see the glory of the Lord illuminating all from the top of Mount Sinai. We see Jesus' face glowing like the sun and his clothes dazzling white. And we hear in the second letter of Peter, our epistle today, that the gospel is like a lamp shining in a dark place, carrying on shining until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Last year, the ICSA report, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, came out. It was horrifying reading the reports. Reading reports and statements by the victims into what had been done to them. Horrified in reading the response by the church, cover-ups, damage limitation. And then, a few weeks ago, I watched the documentary on Bishop Peter Ball. And so seeing some of it acted out made it feel even worse, even though I knew much of what was coming. The sinking realisation of how complicit the Church of England, amongst others, has been in covering up abuse, seeking to bury anything negative rather than acknowledging some of its leaders had committed terrible crimes. But we are reminded in 2 Peter that the Gospel continues shining until it is visible. It feels a terrible position to be in, realising quite what has gone on. And we naturally worry what else there is to come out. What other scandals and crimes have been committed which haven't yet been revealed. But the culture of safeguarding is changing as individual churches, in addition to deaneries and dioceses, we are realising we can't pretend nothing is wrong and continuing to cover, cover up potential abuse. I've mainly referred to sexual abuse, but there are also issues of spiritual, emotional, physical and financial abuse happening linked in with all of that. We are taking safeguarding more seriously. We are responding when there are concerns and, where necessary, working with other agencies to keep people safe, not just moving it on to a different setting. That is why we have a safeguarding officer in each church and why we need to do safeguarding training to prevent things like this happening again. But the gospel continues shining until it becomes visible, we are told in our epistle. It appears this had started happening as the repercussions of Ixa bear fruit and the light of Jesus Christ illuminates things more fully. It is uncomfortable, it is unnerving, and we do worry what else might come to light. But it has to. The light of Jesus Christ needs to illuminate our hearts and our lives, making visible those things which had been hidden away. Through their encounter with the glowing and transfigured Jesus, Peter, James and John's understanding of who Jesus is changed. May our understanding about Jesus also change, from just seeing Jesus as a friend, to someone who is our saviour, someone who redeems us, someone through whom our lives are transfigured. 
and as we journey into and through Lent, may our lives move more and more from darkness to light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.